this presentation came to mind during exercise class. I believe it. So thrice weekly in summertime, with the ladies who crunch, I am surrounded by people who stare at my sweaty body. And who are they? The postman is usually up there, tends to smile a bit. Now there are 13 paintings, 13 people I should say, and nine paintings by Margaret Fitzhugh Brown, mixed among other artists' paintings. She called them her Squam portraits. So for brevity's sake, I'll use her initials MFB from now on. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is known as RBG, so why not? <laughs> now I'll introduce you to the people she chose to paint and tell you as much as I can about them. And her particular style of portraiture will become apparent as we look at each painting. MFB posed all of her subjects, and she very carefully created the background scene. And almost <coughs> all painting took place inside her upstairs studio, which is Cove House, 31 River Road. She specified the clothing that each sitter would wear and the objects that were in the picture. And her portraits were a direct stylistic link to the waxworks that she created last century and that have become a yearly tradition of seafair. This evening I am serving you a nine-course artistic ban banquet provided by MFB, and a special dessert will follow. Now the first of the Anasquam portraits was in 1925, and the last in 1957. They are anonymous as to the sitters, except for Captain Bunker Stanwood and one half of Peter Piper. Come to that later. In 1927, MFB began a diary that she continued with daily entries throughout the ensuing years. Why was this year of 1927 so important? On January the 1st, as arranged by her patrons, the Wisewoods of New York and Anasquam, she was on her way to paint the King of Spain in his palace in Madrid. This event made headlines in the American art world, particularly because she was a woman. And the king, Alfonso XIII, was probably attracted to the plan as he had an eye for the ladies. It was likely no accident that he chose a bedroom in the palace for his sitting. So thanks to technology, we know more about the Anasquam portraits from 1927 because MFB wrote about them in her diaries. All 26 of those diaries have been digitized. They are available online through archive.org. You will appreciate, however, that the writing is not the easiest to read. This is the first two pages of her first diary, and of course the star is on Madrid. The Lobsterman is the title of her first Squam portrait. It was painted in 1926 before her trip to Spain, so I don't have information from her diaries about that. But I'll return to the painting, which you can see here, it's on the back wall. I'll return to the painting after telling you about the subjects. The village scrapbook entry from 1929 indicates that James Robinson is the man on the left, and Light Davis is on the right. Note that when I downloaded this image about the scrapbook, there had already been over 600 views of items in our AVH scrapbook, which is on archive.org website. And they are not all mine, nor David McAvaney's. <laughs> in 1928, this painting was awarded uh, honorable mention, essentially second prize, at an exhibition in New York. And MFB had photographs made of the painting, and so we're lucky that one of them made it into the scrapbook with the names added at the time. I'm not planning for you to be able to read this because I just wanted to let you know that much of the data that I was able to obtain was from census reports of Anasquam, i.e. Gloucester, and this is the U.S. Census from 1920. The um, census is, is good because it shows what their 
trade or their business was. And at this time, he's listed as being a deep sea fisherman living at 81 Leonard Street. The house has been beautifully restored and is the summer home of the Foley's. Now, if we go back to the 1900 census, Winthrop O. Davis is son of the lighthouse keeper, John Davis, hence his nickname, Light. <laughs> I'm using cheat sheets. I don't usually, but this is important data here. Now, Winthrop O. Davis in 1920, now an adult with his own family, lives on Denison Street. He too is listed as a deep sea fisherman. House numbers have changed on that street, but I do believe that he lived here. His son Winthrop A. Davis, better known as Bunt, and some of you in the audience may remember Bunt, I know Jimmy Groves does, later owned this house. This is on Denison Street. When she painted, MFB would have made an initial small sketch in oil after she had posed the two men, and then she would have transferred that sketch to a bigger canvas. Did she decide to make them lobstermen for the title of the painting? I'm guessing yes. Rather than there being deep sea fishermen, the older man Jim holds a corncob pipe and Light Davis smokes a more modern version. Each man would have sat separately for the larger picture maintaining the initial pose from her early oil sketch. So separate sittings may account for the slightly awkward position of the adjacent knees in the lower part of the painting. I'm no artist, but it was just interesting when looking at all of these images how closely you start to see the details. Where did they pose in 1925? Can you identify the spot? Yeah, the corner of the Custom House Wharf, thanks to the Curtis family who let me take a photo. Then the property of the Clarks. It was next door to Cove House. An early image of the area demonstrates the style of lobster posh that is in the painting. And all images, by the way, are courtesy of the Anasquam Historical Society. And I'll mention that my husband, David Teal, and Betsy Horowitz have been responsible for making it possible to show you a lot of these old images. MFB wrote a book, Portrait Painting, published in 1933. But I'm showing you this picture at the corner because I think you can appreciate how she would have sat these men at the corner of that uh, wharf across from what later became the market wharf. <coughs> When she wrote her book, she was very certain about her principles of composition. She stated them firmly. No composition can be entirely successful unless the artist has felt the harmony and balance of it himself. And I think the lobsterman is a good painting to consider whether she obeyed her principles. Horizontal lines repeated in picture give repose. She did not paint odalisques. Nothing is horizontal. No, all of those people are upright. In contrast, vertical orientation is the rule. Diagonals, which give action and dynamic quality, are her forte. And you'll see the pyramid design in several of her portraits. Large, quiet areas should be contrasted with smaller passages where there is interest of detail. And this is where her arrangement of background objects really is of note. Now, come back to the painting. Each lobsterman owns half of the canvas, but the men are connected by Light Davis's overlapping arm. The ramp is a strong diagonal, marked by a, matched by a diagonal shoulder tip to shoulder tip and a crossing diagonal passes from the lobster pots along Davis's arm to the angle of Robinson's hand. And look at the hand. Jim Robinson is missing part of his ring finger, possibly his thumb, although I think that may be positional. Winches and other equipment on board ship were not kind to sailors' hands. And lastly, directly on the vertical midline, there is the contrast of a white dory with dark, dark, decoys in the adjacent dory. 
It must be duck hunting season. Was there an actual white dory? Were the decoys really there? Or was this scene setting by the artist? I'm afraid we'll never know. And the honorable mention that MFB was awarded at the 1928 show of the National Association of Women Painters and Sculptors was well deserved. And that plaque is on the painting. It reminds me to tell you that these Squam paintings, particularly the early ones, are well traveled. More about that when we look at Captain Bunker Stanwood. This portrait from 1926 features J. Edward Stanwood, known in Squam as Bunker. Right over here. In the census of 1910, he is noted as being a shore fisherman, and that's an important clue to his nickname. He lived with his family at 48 Leonard Street. Marcy and Dan Lyman are in the audience. That's where they live. Where did he acquire the name? I don't think he had a porch, though. Where did he acquire the nickname of Bunker? Well, for the fishermen in the crowd, you'll know Menhaden, Pogies, and Bunker are all the same fish, which I have trouble pronouncing, Brevortia tyrannis, and the pilgrims are said to have told, been told by Squanto to manure corn with Menhaden. In Maine, the Abenaki called the fish Pukhagen, and it became Pogi, and the Dutch settlers in New York called the moss bunkers, became bunker. So I think that inshore fishing, or shore fishing, was related to catching <coughs> bait fish in Manhattan. This is an undated photograph. The person on the left is labeled bunker. And this is also undated, possibly 1889. I think that it might be related to the rescue of the Abbey P. Cranmer, which was uh, sunk off of the um, Coffins Beach. I think this was the rescue crew. And Bunker was listed as being one of that crew. Do you think that that's the same person? And look at the hat. I think it was the hat that, that it caught me on. Also, in the fire brigade in WJ8, which is on a firehouse, He's listed as being in this photograph, third from the left, and as a young man, obviously. Now, by 1930, Bunker has shed his children, but not his wife, and is captain, the circle around the ray, is captain of a private yacht, and he is living at 60 Leonard Street, now owned by Mimi Evans. Now, Margaret Fitzhugh Brown painted him as a very strong character. He's vertically oriented, his lovely contrast of color, a dark suit against a background of yellow. It's really a study of a face and hands, those lovely hands. And look at the strong diagonals, the oars, the chair, a background of a building in, the, in, in back is upright, board and batten construction. There's also a house on piles in the background. This photograph identifies the locale. I mentioned that this is very strong diagonals again against the uh, arms, so the very straight, upright person. This is where my husband figured out where this painting was done. The Borden Batten uh, house to the right of the photograph would be Ben's boat shed. It was probably painted a much paler color and the, the uh, piles are on that building that's just to the left. So Bunker would have been sitting on the corner of the boat shed deck and having the picture taken across that area. So she did this as an outdoor portrait. It's not common to do that. She did the lobsterman and Bunker as outdoor portraits, but most of the others are going to be done in Cove House. Now, Bunker makes a splash at North Shore Arts Association. This is to, I'll read this out. Her writing is really tricky to read. But what she says is in her diary, some people were thinking of buying Bunker. I think I'd better tell the Bents as they might be sorry to lose the chance to get him. The supper was not very thrilling. <laughs> 
And the second paragraph there is, Bunker has been over to see it himself and made a great hit. The people asking him to stand beside it, etc., and two ladies who were going out as he came up the steps exclaimed at seeing him, Oh, there he is. Let's go back. <laughs> he said Mr. Ridgway, who was in charge of the uh, show, suggested that he come over some Sunday afternoon when there were more people there, and he thought he would. So Bunker was not sold, but obviously traveled thereafter. There are diary entries that mention packing him up. And other entries, by the way, mention Bunker moving boats for the bends and giving children around the cove sailing lessons. These are some of the places that Bunker's painting has been. The Squam portraits actually acted as MFB's advertising. She wanted commissions for portraits. Keeping her name before the public, particularly the wealthy public, was crucial in that endeavor. And commission paintings, of course, went home with a sitter. Her Squam, squam portraits, as well as other portraits created in her Boston studio, were sent around the country to various exhibitions. And between times, they were on display at Cove House. So these were her calling cards. J. Edward Stanwood and his wife Jenny are buried in the Wesleyan Cemetery on Wheeler's Point. I never knew this actually existed. It was a lovely little cemetery right smack in the middle of the, um, of the point. And he died in 1930, 1936, sorry about that. Now, the old farmer's almanac was posed by Herman Rice in the summer of 1927, and so now we're being helped by entries from her diary. And I'll read this out to you. I'm going to pose old Herm Rice with the light full on him and that shadowing distance as background. The distance she's talking about, an old shawl had been fixed up across her studio at Cove House to get the sun blocked. Have a bully idea for a picture of him. Knees crossed, lighting his pipe with a farmer's almanac face down on his knee. I don't think he was lighting his pipe with the farmer's almanac, but it comes close to that. And a big country store calendar on the shadowy wall behind him, and perhaps other things, furniture, etc., to suggest a dim farmhouse interior, with the light strong on him to bring out the character. She's posing somebody as a farmer. From then on, actually, people thought he was a farmer. So this is her painting of Herm Rice. You can see it's very vertical, I would say. He's a little oblique because probably of a rocking chair that she sat in, but there's lots of vertical lines in this. His knees are no longer crossed as her plan had been. I suspect that it was probably hard for him to hold that pose, and he's not lighting his pipe, he's holding it. A little safer, probably. The other thing I wanted to point out is that she often puts a splash of red into her paintings. And in this particular one, it's the calendar that's on the wall, and we'll come back to that, and, her, and the red handkerchief. Now, the 1930 census lists him as a 69-year-old laborer on a private estate. He and his two sisters live at number one Arlington Street, which has been expanded, obviously, since he lived there. But the reason that I think this is an interesting portrait is that it was posed, it was not of him, it was of a character. And when she saw Sir Herm Rice across the street as I came back from breakfast at Nancy Flagg's The Barnacle and decided to make a sketch for his picture, I asked if he would sit and he came about an hour later we started in and painted until 11.45. She wasn't paying him to pose. She pulled him off of the street and said, Herm, would you like to come and sit in my studio? So this is an undated photograph from um, the Historical Society, which shows Cove House from the, from the water, and the barnacle is to the left. And Cove House now, from the street, you'll see it easily because of the studio windows that have been placed in the front. I think I'll just call, I'll call it just Herm Rice, though I would like to think of a name that suggests the farmer just setting, resting after a hard day's work. He has on a blue shirt, old rusty greenish waistcoat unbuttoned, 
red handkerchief over the back of the chair, pipe in one hand and the farmer's almanac over one knee, and in the shadowed gray wall behind him, a large seed catalog. Now this is important. A large seed catalog calendar, which I will try to get from L.E. Smith or Andrews in Gloucester. His light blue eyes and weather-beaten face and long, lanky lines make him a good type. Herm Rice came for me to paint him about 9.30. I painted until 12 and got a good start. Now, what happened is she would often have these paintings done within a month, but with relatively short sittings. If the weather was poor and the light was not the same as when she had started out with her sketch, she canceled the sittings and she waited for the next good day. I painted on the old farmer's almanac for an hour and finished it except for a little work on the calendar, on the, calendar, on the wall, which I can do without her. Everyone likes it and I think it makes a good picture to exhibit. We'll try it first in the Carnegie Institute International in Pittsburgh, I think. So yet another of our small portraits is going, making the rounds. Monday, August 29th, I got started painting early and finished the calendar in the old farmer's almanac, so that is all done now. now in between these entries, there's some interesting other little additions. When you look at this painting critically, you go, it looks a little ragged around his, uh, around here. You see this, just around here? What had happened is she'd shown the painting to somebody and said, I'm not sure about this, what do you think? And they said, oh, we think the tablecloth should be darker. So she actually repainted it darker and then decided, no, she don't like it, she painted it back. So there's a little bit of ragginess down there. And the other thing is that the calendar, and I've pointed out the tablecloth, the calendar, is written as 1907, but remember, it's not 1907 that she's painting this. The calendar she gets from Gloucester is of 1927, and she uses the dates that are listed from 1927. So it doesn't match the, the year. So almost 100 years later, we've caught her out on a trick. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. Now his face is reddish purple, um, and I mention that because I was in medicine for a while. We used to talk about people with mitral facies. In other words, people who had rheumatic fever as children and ended up with mitral stenosis. And they very characteristically had this kind of a face. Um, it is mentioned in the scrapbook that he was ill for a long period of time and not up to work. Uh, and often used to sit around the stove downstairs in the post office yarning away with all the other folks who came in through the door. So I think he might have been one of these folks who early on got childhood rheumatic fever. I can't prove it, I haven't found his death certificate. I'm pointing out the Farmer's Almanac. Anybody subscribe to the Farmer's Almanac? Yeah, he got one. Oh, that's grand. You and Sarah Hackett. <laughs> now, I was hoping that Sarah would be in the audience tonight because I walked into her house the other day and I saw the farmer's own neck hanging there and I thought, this is perfect, right, right in time for my talk. But the other reason that she puts it there is because of that photograph. And I'll show you that photograph to see her great grandmother. No, it's her grandmother, so it's not great. It's her grandmother is sitting by the same place with her cat, and the farmer's almanac is hanging off the, off the uh, fireplace. So, no, this is pretty I'm, getting, I'm glad Sarah's not here. She would have heard this. It's her great grandmother, I think. Yes, great grandmother. And because of her portrayal of Herman Rice as a farmer, uh, later references to the painting, mistaken as a farmer. And in fact, when the farmer's almanac got into real strife in the Depression, and was not getting any subscriptions, they asked her for this painting, for the painting of Herman Rice, to use as advertising. She said, all right, I'll give you a good rate on it, but you have to include my signature. And they didn't. And she, was ne she never forgave them for that. And that particular editor, I might mention, never, never made it past the next year. I don't think it was her doing it. It was the Depression that, that did it. Now, who's... Favorite painting is the village postman. I think everybody, yeah, everybody would say yes. And that's James or Jim Moreau. And here he is, 
He's the only one who has a bit of a smile, really. And of course, people didn't smile. It's much harder to hold a pose like that. Also, many of them had bad teeth or no teeth. So you'll see the portraits of that era are often with the mouth closed. But he's got a bit of a smile. Now, where do you think this was posed? Any ideas? She doesn't go far from home. I think it's Cove House. Cove House, absolutely. So um, this is where Jimmy, who, who he was called Sonny and called Jimmy, in the 1910 census, he lived at 75 Leonard Street. He had a wife and three daughters. The wife died in 1915, and he married a second time, and then moved to 701 Washington Street. But he was the Squam postman for many years. This is a, an entry from 1929. I beat it back to the studio as Jimmy Moreau was coming for me to make a sketch for the painting I'm going to do of him. I posed him with his mailbag over his shoulder, a bundle of letters in one hand and an apple with a bite out of it on the other, leaning against one of the posts of the piazza, her house, with some hollyhocks and a bit of the street in background. I had rather an interrupted time as the telephone kept ringing but managed to get the sketch made before he had to go back to the post office. Now, just so you know what the uh, anatomy of this, here, here is Cove House right here, and he would have been standing at the edge of the piazza. I didn't know what these flowers were until that diary entry, and they're hollyhocks. They look a little less prolific than do Peg Collar's hollyhocks, which are, uh, she recognizes her hollyhocks. I didn't take any. <laughs> And the house in background, in the back, of course, is the house that's right across the street, is that house, which is covered now by all the bushes. So 26 River Road. So that's where he was posed. Lunch at Mrs. P's. Now that's ten, that turns out to be Mrs. Publicover, who we'll meet later. And painted Jane Rowe. He is thrilled about being painted and very amusing. And there is a noticeable improvement in the delivery of the green mail. <laughs> he has to hustle over his route to get through in time for a sitting. <laughs> now, I will read this. I'm sorry for the small print, but it's just it, this man is known around the world as the Whistling Postman. He was known as Sonny Moreau. And in fact, I found an article in the Singapore papers about him. Jim Moreau is perhaps the most original mail carrier in these United States, village housewives, know by his whistle the character of the mail they are about to receive. He takes his cue from the postmarks and return addresses. For example, if Aunt Emma sees him approaching her front gate, whistling a medley of my body lies over the ocean, anchors away, star-spangled banner and Dixie, she knows without looking that her morning's batch of communications will be a letter from her brother in Scotland, one from her nephew at Annapolis, anchors away, her husband's pension check from Washington, Star Spangled Banner, and a card from a neighbor's child in Miami, Dixie. Sunny Jim rarely guesses wrong on a name in the left, upper left hand corner. They tell a story of the time he gave a woman something from a Gloucester dentist accompanied by the whistle line from over there the one about the Yanks are coming. And sure enough, the lady had seven teeth yanked that very morning, that very afternoon, sorry. Later, when questioned, he admitted that his cue in that instance was derived from the maiden's swollen jaw. Otherwise, the envelope could have contained a bill rather than a notice of an appointment. Mr. Moreau is consistent. On the first of the month, most of his customers get a mournful line from Chopin's funeral march. That's when you paid your bills. After lunch, I had my last sitting with Jimmy Moreau and finished it. It was rather cold and windy, and the sun kept going behind clouds, but it was out enough to get what I wanted. She needed the light exactly the same. See, you read that time and time again. While I was away, Jimmy Moreau's portrait was put on the easel inside the house as if he were looking out the window. And Jay was delighted because his family were fooled by it and thought he was standing there. <laughs> so, very strong pyramid with Mr. Moreau. Everything else is vertical lines. And Sonny Jim lives on in the, in the uh, village hall. 
He died um, of illness. It, it talks about a lingering illness in the newspapers for about two years, and he dies in 1937, buried in Beechbrook Cemetery. I found a lot of cemeteries in Gloucester I never knew existed, and, and this is a, a family plot. Now, I mentioned that Margaret Fitzhugh Brown didn't give names and half of Peter Piper. His name was really Charles Piper. So Peter Piper's shop was done in 1931. And here is the famous painting of Peter Piper's shop, which is in the back corner there. This shop is a muddle. And she talks about that being uh, just bits and pieces of things all over the place. It isn't the first shop because originally, and I think probably around 1909, 1910, another old photograph, it was down near River Road, and this store was converted into his shop. It actually belonged to the man who, who owned the, the big Harriton house across the street. So Peter Piper set up shop every summer. We think he might be this gentleman in the corner with his hat, but we don't know the names of the other folks, and I'm not sure that that's actually him. We think it might be. This was such a popular view and such a popular place. It was called the Cabin Bazaar, 1A, in Anasquan. It was made into a postcard. So that's why this says AHSPC postcard. Then at some point, he actually moved to the back of the village hall. Still used the name Cabin Bazaar, but used the shed back here, or the back of the village hall, I should say. And we're not sure how long he stayed there. <clears throat> what we do know is that he then moved to 15 Walnut Street. And this, again, was made into a postcard. And you can see that he would have known that this was going to be an important day, because he's walking down the steps, and he's got his suit of clothes on. And this is the village shop now, not called the Cabin Bazaar. And what Margaret Fitzhugh Brown talks about is what the sketch was like. This morning, I made the sketch for Peter Piper's portrait, and I'm much pleased with it. I was there about two hours, as it was a slow process. There were so many interruptions with people coming in to buy things, etc. There's a nice, intelligent girl to wait on people, too. But things are in such a mess that no one but Peter Piper could tell where anything was. He is a character. I am doing him in his battered old yachting cap leaning against the postcard and toy counter with the dim interior of the shop and its jumble of packing boxes, ladder up to the loft, high studio window, etc., behind him, and an electric light bulb and a big colored balloon and a fly flapper hanging from the beam over his head. Hardly a simple painting. I painted on Peter Piper this morning. He was not ready for a long time and in fact, didn't finish his breakfast all the morning, taking bites at intervals from a thick sandwich he brought over in a saucepan and brown paper from his room over the garage across the road. And we wonder whether that's what is now Dave Purse's house. Miss Thompson, the red-headed girl who helps him in the shop, told me when he wasn't there of the people who cheated him, some are people who went away and didn't pay their bills, and little meannesses done him. He had his shop for 20 years, and the yachting cap he's wearing in the portrait since he came to Anasquam. It certainly looks it, and it is rather tired, but he puts paper inside to hold the crown up, as he says the fashion is to have them stand up a bit more now. So his crown's a little elevated. The heights were quite crazy about Peter Piper's portrait. He is evidently a little troubled because of the clothes I have painted him in, said the yachting club cap. Yachting club. Yachting cap was very old, and one that he just wore as he went to and fro with an airy gesture, and that he was afraid he looked as if he had come over in the ark. <laughs> this is the picture of Peter Piper when he was all dressed up for his postcard shot in front of his house. 15 Walnut Street. Yeah. Recognize it? Yeah. Okay. Now, actually, people don't usually recognize it, think of it when they walk past it, but when you turn it around, 
Didi in last year, photograph from Leonard Street, where we can see the outline of the house more clearly. She remembers, and she's here tonight, she remembers when they moved in there that the ladder was still there. So this is Peter Piper. He's a little bit squiff. He's got a, certainly a strong diagonal going up that ladder. And diagonal may be along his arm, but trying to make him into a pattern like some of the others was a little difficult. She painted him as a jumble. Very sympathetically, though, I think. This is to show you that he was C.H. Piper. This is the back of one of the postcards that he had printed. He printed postcards to sell. And also, Margaret Fitzhugh Brown was very good about it. She gave him uh, pictures to sell. This is what we think was his boarding house. I'm sure it's been uh, maintained much better than it was in 1918, but he lived at 21 Severance Avenue in Jamaica Plain during the winter months. His business was only summer. So he was called in the Gloucester City Directory the owner of a variety store. And she helped him out because she took out the photos of the other Squam characters. Notice she doesn't say people, she calls them characters. I have painted to see if he would be interested in having postcards of them on sale, and he was delighted. His would make six in the series, and I think it would be quite nice, and he might make some money out of it. And those were done by Alice Curtis over in Washington Street in Gloucester. <clears throat> Apple pie, hold the public over. Remember, Margaret Fitzgerald Brown mentions about going to Mrs. P's. This is who, who this person is. You've all seen this. It's called the apple pie. Who was she? She was Hulda Erickson from Sweden, 1867, when she was born. She immigrated to the, this country as an infant. We don't know much about her after that, except that she married in 1891. She married James Publicover from Nova Scotia. If you look at the name Publicover, it really is Nova Scotia, Eastern Canada, in derivation. 1900 to, the, to 1915, the Publicovers own and manage the Grandview Hotel. And that's what Peter talked about last time. And 1916, Holder runs Ye Old Tavern Tea Room at 11 Leonard Street. And this is a difficult address because sometimes it's Two River Road, sometimes it's 11 Leonard Street because it's the same property. The old tavern was there in Andrew Harridan's uh, time. It became a tea room and she would serve lunches, possibly dinners as well, and that's how she made her living. Her husband died in 1919 and he died in Maine. We're not quite sure why that was the case, but she was left a widow. This is 11 Leonard Street slash Two River Road, and that's where she had her tea room. And Margaret Fitzhugh Brown would walk up the street for lunch. She was not somebody who cooked frequently. She went other places for her meals. Mrs. Publicover came for a sketch, got a good setup, apple pie, Peeling apples, blue checked apron, table with bowls, rolling pin, etc. Sounds like a waxwork list, doesn't it? I painted on Mrs. Publicover and got a lot done. She is a good soul and loves to reminisce about the early days of Squam, the artists who came to the hotel when she and Mr. P ran it. September 20th, cold and clear. I managed to keep Mrs. Publicover warm while she was posing with fires in both fireplaces and the electric heater that I had brought down from Halfway House, 5 Arlington Street. So it wasn't easy posing for Margaret Fitzhugh Brown. This morning, only 45 degrees at breakfast time, I got the car out and called for Mrs. Publicover and finished the picture. I think it is one of my best, and I'm quite pleased with my bifocal glasses now that I have got used to them. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, some of the pictures before were done not with quite so good eyesight. Now, does anybody recognize this car? It's Bill Friend in the audience. So Bill Friend bought her car, second car, a 1936 Ford Cabriolet, and he lent me his model of his precious car. So if you saw him tearing around here in the 40s, he was driving her car, her used car. 
Wise is written, that's Mr. Wisewood, Henry Wisewood, one of her patrons, very enthusiastic about my picture of Mrs. Publicover, and talked this afternoon about buying all my Squam characters and giving them to the Village Hall Association to hang in the Village Hall when he can afford it. This is 1937, this is depression, and even the rich people were having trouble. But that's the first instance that I read where these were going to be given to the Village Hall Association. So let's look at her. She's a sad lady, isn't she? Don't you think so? Wistful. Very, right down the middle of the, of the image. Pyramid. And I don't think that the arm of that sieving, I have one of those. Does everybody have one of those sieves in there? Yeah, rusted. Okay, I think that arm was put up there to give her a line down. She's a pyramidal, very prominent portrait. But she also features in the rag rug, 1940, hold a public over. Margaret Fitzy Brown was addicted to painting. She had to paint. And if she couldn't find a commission, I think then she went around and looked for people who would pose for her. And Hilda, being a good soul, posed for her again. This time, it was called the Rag Rug. She posed with a rug in Cove House. And this is a, has some interesting stories about it. Because not only was Hilda a widow, she was the guardian of her grandson, who was left with her at the age of three. So in the 1930 census, here's Hilda taking care of a three-year-old her son's only child. The mother was born in Virginia, so we think the mother was not around at all. In 1940, when she's posing for the rag rug, she's 73 years old, and grandson Lewis is 13 years old. Now, I just can't believe what it would be like trying to deal with this grandson, because he was a bit of a hard case. Got Mrs. P, worked for an hour, getting her posed, and the whole setup arranged. Mrs. P is much worried over her grandson, Lewis. Sometimes he's spelled Lewis with an O-U, sometimes it's L-E-W. It appears ran away Sunday afternoon, 13-year-old. She had a telegram yesterday that he was in New York, but knows nothing more about him. Poor woman. This is why she's sitting for this portrait. Wednesday, July 24th, got Mrs. P at 8.30, Worked on my picture till 10.30, got a good start. Nothing about Mrs. Public Cover. July 25th, I had Mrs. P again in the morning. She still hasn't heard from that young brat, Lewis. The New York police have got in touch with the Gloucester police, and an officer came to get his father's address so that he could be sent home. We think that Reginald, the father, was actually in Gloucester, and possibly a fisherman. Tuesday, July 30th, I painted on Mrs. Publicover's picture. It's going to be good, I think. Lewis is back. Had quite an experience, which I hope will teach him a lesson. Was put in a type of reformatory or temporary prison run by the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. That's my exclamation point. Had to wear stripes, hard labor, bad food, about 300 children, some practically criminals. Now, he was known in the neighborhood uh, to be a difficult person. Sarah Hackett remembers him very well. And interestingly, um, Kenny Hodgkins told us the story that this young man, uh, or he was a student at the time, actually locked him in our outhouse on 39 Leonard Street and set fire to the outhouse. So this was a child who was not going to have an easy future. Um, Painted on the rug in Mrs. P's picture, I'm trying to get a worsted worked motto to go on the wall. So she knew what she wanted, but she hadn't got that motto yet to go on the wall. Painted on Mrs. Publicover. Paint is, she's always painting on the canvas, on the person. And we'll be able to finish it tomorrow if I can get the motto. Same date, got one in the PM from Mrs. Deacon, who lived at the head of the cove. Perfect, the Lord is my shepherd. Saturday, August 3rd, had Mrs. Public over, over for the last sitting and finished it, and I'm quite pleased with it. Don't know what to do next, but I'm going to keep on making pictures as long as I can afford it. Such a depressing time, World War II coming. 
So she has her off center this time, and it's not straight in the middle. She looks sad, again. She has a nice angle going that way and that way. And she also has a secondary triangle with this ball of, of um, cotton that has been woven into a braid. Margaret Fitzy Brown didn't pay much attention to the actual making of a, of a plaid, of a braided rug. I've made them, and this is not quite how you do it, but that's okay. She had the idea, and she wanted to get it to fit her idea. And there's the motto that's in the back, the Lord is my shepherd. So now you can see Hulda Public over in, her, in the second painting. Hulda dies February the 21st, 1943, and her grandson disappears, presumed dead in World War II. So a sad family, really. And I always feel kind of sorry when I look at her pictures to realize that's all we have left of her family. The Sewing Bee, we're getting to the end, folks. Sewing Bee by Margaret Fitzy Brown was posed by Mrs. Joseph Rice, Mrs. Ernest Perthen, and Mrs. George Blanchard. This is where I go on my ranch and say, what's their name, please? Yeah. Because the only way I can get to these ladies is through their husbands, if I'm lucky. But we did figure out who they were. Grace Rice, Leela Griffin, and Essie Blanchard. And they're usually right behind me on this wall here. So she's calling it the Sewing Bee, which isn't the group that was known in the village of the Sewing Bee. She just wanted three people together. And that was always called a bee, if three people helped, or if a couple of people helped each other out. Grace Rice was the widow of Joseph Rice, ran the family business, Rice's and a School Ice Company, from 1944 to 1953. And some of you in the group will remember Rice's Ice. And some of you will remember saying Rice's Ice has lice. <laughs> Joe Rice's portrait, 1930, by Margaret Fitzhugh Brown, is in the Cape Ann Museum. This is an unusual one, because the subject's in profile. But that was her husband. Leela Griffin was the woman with the parasol in 1923 when the stagecoach was in the Gloucester 300th Parade. Ernest had retired as a carpenter and a house builder by the 1940 census, and he lived with Leela on Harbor Street. So that's where she lived at the end of her life. George and Essie Blanchard lived at 846 Washington Street. He's listed as a retail grocery clerk in the census of 1940 and as a musician, and a musician was really his first love. He played the organ, his wife sang in the choir, and they're very much involved with the village church. They actually are living in the house that her parents owned, so he probably wasn't terribly well off, and, but they had a house to live in. And this is what 846 Washington Street looks like. <coughs> also went to see Mrs. Blanchard about posing for a painting and planning of three women's sewings. She had it in her head the sewing bee. She will do it and suggested some others. One, one Mrs. Harvey, now I don't know which Mrs. Harvey it was, wouldn't do it. But Mrs. Rice, who I went to see after supper, will. Now I only need one more. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Ernie Griffin and hope we can begin the sketch Friday. I saw Mrs. Griffin and she'll pose, so I'm all set for tomorrow. I had the three ladies, Mrs. Rice, Mrs. Griffin, and Mrs. Blanchard. They're all, they're not by first names, they're always Mrs. or Miss. Planned out the sketch for the sewing bee. Made a sketch, but it wasn't very good. But I think I can change it a little on the big canvas, and it may be all right. So she really wasn't quite sure about this whole effort. I'm not going to read all of this, but just to make sure that you see that she had multiple sittings likely one person at a time. Every so often there were two. I felt more like painting on September 18th and did better. Painted on Mrs. Rice and Mrs. Griffin and finished the picture on Tuesday, October the 7th. Now, this is a pyramid. She's got a pyramid going with the three figures. <clears throat> they were all, I'm sure, told to wear their pearls. They also, there's a diagonal that goes through the painting and, and another pyramid as well uh, that if, in terms of the composition. But again, she didn't really care much about the accuracy. This is a paper pattern, I am sure. But you don't cut out a paper pattern with a fabric all wrinkled like this, you know. She just knew what she wanted to get across, and she did it. 
So this is the sewing bee. All of the ladies are looking down. <clears throat> they were all probably separately done uh, and at different times and then put together on the canvas. Last one, the Punch and Judy show, 1957. It's the last of the Squam paintings. Carrie, David, and Judy Lacey. Carrie is the one on the far left, Davey, <clears throat> and um, Judy. Both of the girls have since died, and so the only person left from the Squam paintings is actually David in the middle. Very quiet fourth, no firecrackers and noise nowadays. That's interesting, 1957. I did some mending and repair jobs on Foster David's puppets for his Punch and Judy show, which he puts on every year at the fair, and when he came to get them, I asked him if he would sit for me for the painting demonstration at the North Shore on Saturday, and he seemed glad to do it. So I think that maybe the genesis of this particular painting was the fact that Foster Damon had asked her, or she had seen that these needed mending, the puppets which are still in the firehouse, and that set up this connection. She knew Foster Damon, no question about it, but this caused a relationship. Went over to the North Shore in the morning to get things set up for my painting demonstration. After lunch, called for Foster Damon and took him over to sit for me. And people would pay to see the artist have a sitter and paint them. I got a good likeness of him and the whole thing was very successful. About 15 artists working and over 200 people. Brought Foster home and left the sketch with him as he seemed to want it. So I was hoping, his PD may not be here because he's got other commitments, but I'm hoping that perhaps that's still in the family, that sketch. Now this is the last Squam portrait, and it was painted in 1957. And I'll read it. Got the Punch and Judy from Foster Dame, and as I'm thinking of painting it with children in front. So she got the stage, the little stage that was used in the Punch and Judy show. Uh, the children back to silhouetted against it with probably Mr. Punch and the Hangman. Not sure whether I can get the light effects I want, but we'll try it out. We'll set it up after I finish Mrs. C or Mr. C and the painting demonstration on Saturday. Sorry, I should have typed that out for myself to remember. So she did get the Punch and Hangman, and she did get the children, and they were probably done separately, Carrie, David, and Judy, because David, who was only four at the time, does not remember sitting in front of the theater. The Lacey family, many of you will know the Lacey family, lived at Ten River Road. Dr. Hamer Lacey was a World War II veteran, pediatrician, well-liked by the, the community, and a peace activist. And this photograph, taken obviously when he's a lot older, is from the collection of World War II uh, veterans at Cape Ann Museum. And Jason Grove, who took the photograph, was very happy to have it shown tonight. So he remembers posing in the studio. This is David, but he does not believe the puppet show was in front of him while he was sitting with his sisters. That's what she would do. She would do things separately. So Punch and Judy. Margaret Fitzhugh Brown is buried in Mount Adams Cemetery, very small stone in the ground, 1884 to 1972. Hope has Hope has let me have a picture of her portrait that's hanging in Coat House right now. I think somebody in this Fenway studio might have done this, and we don't know who the artist was. I doubt that it was a self-portrait. She had other self-portraits, and it's possible that it was, but. I think this was done by somebody else who really captured her look. Um, she was an interesting lady. So my job now is to draw the curtain on this particular thing, on this particular uh, episode. I want to show you what the Punch and Judy show looks like now. It's been rehabbed a little bit, but that theater is still in the firehouse. The thank yous don't include everybody who's helped me out here, but David and Betsy and John, who worked on the postcards and the images are the reason that you could see them tonight. Dee Dee Sargent, if she hadn't had the story of Peter Piper's house and I hadn't realized about that, I wouldn't be able to tell you about it. Hope gave me the photograph and let me look at Cove House. Penny Littlefield filled me in some more on Foster Damon's history. David Lacey talked to me on the phone. 
the Curtis family helped me get onto the right part of the wharf to take the photograph. Sarah Hackett, bless her, had a farmer's almanac. And I might mention that the Yankee magazine owns that. There are four million subscribers right now, and they've put the hole back because they got so many people being angry that the hole, which had saved them $40,000 a year, was no longer present for them to hang it up on a piece of string. Bill Friend with his model of the, of the car. The setup crew, I've got to thank Eleanor, my daughter, because she came over and moved chairs faster than anybody could believe possible. Sue Harris has helped, Betsy has helped, all of the setup crew, Holly's here too. And Steve Harris in particular went to the ends of the world here to get the screen back because it wasn't here this afternoon. <laughs> So a big shout out to, and a tip of the hat to Steve Harris, who's sorted me out with the AV and also got the screen. Now, to be philosophical for a moment, there are only two tenses, the future and the past. The second, the minute, we think we're in the present tense, it's already past. As we move from one season to the next in this village, all of us are part of Anna's Holmes' history. The past is remembered in terms of his story and her story, stories that are written or spoken or represented in photographs, sculpture, or paintings, such as those I've shown you tonight. And history has a way of repeating itself. I'm looking right over here at the corner person here. And this special treat this evening is to include all of you. So I was asked to do a portrait of Jim. And um, I was thrilled with the prospect of doing this. So, of course, the first thing I did was to speak to Jim. I said to Jim, Jim, you know, you've been talking about retiring, and we're not going to see you, and we, we love you, and we want to keep you in our memory, so I've been asked to do your portrait. Will you sit for me? He looked at me and said, are you kidding? <laughs> I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. You know, you make it easy for me if you would sit for me. He said, not on your life. I'm not sitting here. <laughs> That's not what I did. He's a very self-effacing, modest man. And the idea that he would have a portrait was something that he would never participate in. So I started working on a picture that I received uh, uh, from his wife through uh, Deb Marston. It was a little picture of Jim and I, so all of this sitting and planning and triangles and parallels didn't apply to this board. <laughs> so I had this picture and basically this is, I, I worked from that one little picture to try to get his face in a, in a mood that we all recognize, you know, a certain thing. And I'm very happy to have that in the mouth, you know, because the mouth is everything in a portrait. And so that came very quickly to me because I know Jim and I care for Jim and I see Jim every day. So as hard, it, as, hard as it was to do it from a picture, knowing him and caring about him made the job much simpler. Although it did take the winter <laughs> to finish it. But I had the best time. I cannot tell you what joy this painting has given to me. And I went through a lot of difficult uh, iterations to get to this point, but it's there. I'm happy with it. I'm so happy that the village will have it. <laughs>